I'd like to welcome you to uh, the last SPPD, or we're not SPPD. Uh, <laughs> but the last, uh, sorry, sorry, you know, something about inertia. Um, but uh, the last governance salon of the, the year, and we're really uh, excited to have Elizabeth Gerber, who is a professor of public policy at the University of Michigan, and an extremely well known and regarded scientist. Um, Elizabeth is uh, the author of, in my view, a couple of the best books on uh, direct democracy, um, and uh, has done uh, quite a lot of work in, uh, in uh, state and local um, government. And so uh, it's, it's very nice to have you here. Thank you, Tony. Great. Thank you. We're going to talk today about um, a piece of a, a broader research agenda. Um, the piece I'm going to be talking today is largely collaborative with my colleague Jenna Bednar at the University of Michigan. Um, and But the broader project is um, uh, my attempt to better understand uh, how political geography, how the geographic space within which politics takes place, affects both political behavior and political outcomes. So, if I were, if someone, if any of you were to ask me, I'll just assume you're asking me now. I'll answer the question even though you haven't actually asked me. If you were to ask me, you know, what's sort of your broader research agenda? I think that's probably how I'd characterize it right now. Is how does, how does um, the geographic space, the geographic context within which political behavior takes place, affect that behavior, and not just sort of in the background. So to tr really try to incorporate um, systematically ideas about and 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 sort of. Um, measurement of geographic conditions within which politics takes place to better understand how it's affecting uh, those politics and, and in the meet and sort of in doing so to really start asking different questions about um, how the space within which politics takes place actually matters. So that's sort of the broader research agenda, the broader context within which this paper um, is situated. I guess that's what this slide says to some extent. Um, so, um, so, so my starting point really is an assumption, and it is an assumption that since politics takes place in space, space very likely matters. And so really to think about systematically what happens when we ignore spatial effects and what happens when we start to incorporate them in our theories and our models and our analyses of political behavior. I think some of the a long time ago, political science, I should also say, you know, I wear a lot of hats. I, I'm a political scientist. Nobody would mistake me for anything but a political scientist. Um, but I, I currently work in a policy school, and I'm very interested in public policy. So I think you'll see throughout this talk that really um, there's a strong, strong dose of political science here. I hope it's also interesting to lots of people who consider themselves public policy scholars. I really try to talk across those lines. They're not really lines. They're just sort of areas, um, spaces maybe, if you will. Um, and so, um, but coming out of a political science tradition, it seems to me that there's a huge gap in how we think about political phenomena. Um, a long time ago, before I was a political scientist, political geography was actually an important subfield, an, an important area of political science. Um, and so if we think about VOQ and sort of all the sort of traditional sort of pre-behavioral political science, space really did matter in those studies. Um, and I think, uh, you know, my predecessors at Michigan and the other folks who are kind of responsible for really shifting the focus in political science to a more individual, behavioral, um, more economic focused um, approach. Um, certainly not deliberately, but as a as sort of an indirect consequence, has sort of left the, the study of space behind. Um, there are exceptions. There are areas of political science. There certainly are areas of public policy. For those of you who are planners, obviously, you guys think about space. Um, but bringing this in from a political science direction, um, there are also 
a number of subfields within in political science where space matters a bit more. Um, thinking a lot about international relations and inter international trade um, and sort of relationships between countries and how geographic proximity may affect that. Um, of course, there's a whole field of spatial econometrics. Um, I really see what I'm doing as different than that. Um, I see a lot of that work as being much more sort of account like sort of getting rid of space. So, you know, acknowledging that there are interdependencies between actors due to where they sit in geographic space. And to do our econometrics, we need to get rid of that stuff so that we can actually get unbiased estimates or efficient estimates. That's not really what I'm up to here. I really want to do a much more systematic job of trying to embed um, spatial measures of spatial relationships and um, explicit consideration of political geography in, in our theories and models of political behavior. And as a consequence, I think to kind of ask different questions about how do people make decisions, how do people interact within a political environment. Okay. So that's sort of by way of motivation. So what am I up to? Uh, in terms of my approach. Um, so again, I, I'd like, I'm, I'm working on developing, testing theories of political behavior that explicitly model the effects of political geography. Um, and for this particular, I've got a number of papers and studies that are looking at different aspects of political behavior. In this one, I'm going to be looking at campaign contributions. Right? And so for those of you who are interested in campaign contributions, um, Actually, for any of us, I think it's, it's, it's obvious that it's an important form of political behavior. Um, if you just you know, sort of think about the role of money in politics and who's giving money and what kind of consequences that that whole system of campaign finance has, um, there's surprisingly little work on um, big pieces of campaign finance. Um, so we know a lot about PACs. We're learning a lot about super PACs. That's sort of how how we as a discipline kind of think about campaign finance. We know very little about individual campaign donations. So regular people like us make a donation, 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks or 200 bucks or 25 bucks to a candidate. We know very little about what motivates that behavior, what factors uh, relate to patterns that we observe in that behavior. What are the motivations of donors? What do they expect to get? in return for those donations. And so um, leave the space stuff aside for a moment. I'm hoping to sort of shed some light on that behavior just as, a, as an understudied area of political science. But then in addition, um, I will um, assert and um, hopefully then demonstrate through my um, analysis that the effects of political geography on that particular form of political behavior can be profound. And hopefully you'll agree with that when, when I get through my results. Um, OK, so, so that's sort of my focus. And so the specific research question that I'm asking is, do donors target contributions in ways that reflect the political geography of their region? And so if we can answer that question, and if we can see that as geography varies, that you have systematic variation in the behavior of donors and the patterns of donations that result from that behavior, um, then I think we can start to really th say some things about how did that geographic context, what, what was the impact of that geographic context on those behaviors, and learn something both about donations and geography. All right. Um, so anytime we start thinking about political space, political geography, the first question, I think, is which geography? So if you're thinking about a donor who's making, giving money to a political campaign, which is what we're going to be thinking about for a little while, that individual is embedded in an, really an infinite number of geographies, right? You can start thinking about the neighborhood within which the person lives and sort of who's around them in that neighborhood or their city or their region or their state or their congressional district or all sorts of geographies. And for different problems, those different geographies, they matter. Right? So if I'm interested, for example, in voting on school board elections, 
it's going to be a different geography that I really care about than, I'm, than if I'm interested in, as I am here, donations to congressional campaigns. And so I think a, you know, one of the challenges that faces folks who, like me, are interested in questions of political geography are really, are there systematic ways to think about what's the relevant geography for, the, for a given problem, for the problem at hand? That's a bigger question. I'm not going to answer that question here. But it is part of the approach. It's a sort of an inherent aspect of the approach, which is really thinking about, for the problem I care about, what's the geography that I want to focus on, um, and, and why that geography? For this study, I'm going to be looking at US metropolitan areas. So um, in other work, I'm interested in metro areas on their own unrelated to campaign contributions. Um, metro areas are basically labor markets. They're um, major cities. Um, actually, so, so let me clarify for a second. Some of you probably w work with metro areas and study them and understand them. So let me just be pretty precise about what I, how I'm talking about them here. Um, the, the data that I'm going to be using is drawn from the 2000 census, and the metro areas that were in place where that, that were the basis of a lot of the commuting data, which again, I'm going to, I'll talk about in more detail in a moment, are based on the um, metropolitan areas that were drawn in 1999. Um, and in 2003, the OMB changed their designations of metro areas. And so now, rather than using the language that I'm using here as metro areas, You've got core-based statistical areas, which include metropolitan and micropolitan. Just so let's just simplify. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at what the census referred to as metro areas in the 2000 census, which are, as defined here, central cities with at least 50,000 residents. And the counties that, that embed and surround that city that are characterized by a high degree of um, economic and social integration. So they're basically labor markets. They're central cities and then people and the places around them where people live who commute around and into the central city. Okay, So, so, um, so that's where most economic activity in the US takes place. Um, that's where most people live. In these metropolitan areas, about 73% of the US population lived in the way that you know the, the 280 that were drawn by OMB in, in 1999. Now that you've got the redesignation, something over 80%, uh, mid 80s, live in those metro areas. So the vast majority of the US population lives in metro areas. They live either in the cities or the suburbs that surround them. That's where most jobs are. That's where most um, physical infrastructure exists. That's where most most stuff happens, to be honest. Um, and so, so they're important entities. They're important units uh, in and of themselves. I'm going to argue that they delineate many, many citizens' political interests. So presumably, you all live in the Los Angeles metropolitan area. Um, you don't all live in the same city, I presume. <coughs> actually, I know you don't all live in the city of Los Angeles, but you live in the region. But you work in the city, you go to the airport, you go to the museums, you go see your friends, you go recreate, you do all sorts of stuff around the region. Okay? And so what matters around the region, not just right close to home, but region-wide matters. Right? So if, yeah? Just one minor question. Um, given these large regions, you're obviously not directly interested in the partisan choice. No. No, just the. I'll talk to you. I'll, I'll, t I'll clarify exactly what I'm talking about in terms of the campaign donation behavior. OK, yeah, OK, thanks. Um, um, I'm ha feel free to ask clarifying questions. Um, I'm going to leave plenty of time at the end for um, follow-up and you know implications and that sort of thing. So um, you know, don't worry. I'll get you know plenty of time to ask those. But I, but I, do, I do welcome if you've got clarifying questions. Um, it all makes sense to me. <laughs> But it may not all make sense to you, so feel free to ask if you don't if you don't get what I'm talking about. Okay, um, so they delineate many citizens' interests. You you live and work and play and pray and recreate and do all that sorts of sort of stuff in a metro area, not just necessarily in a city, not just necessarily in your congressional district. I'll get to that more on that in a moment. Okay, and from a analytical perspective, they vary enormously in terms of social, economic, physical, and political characteristics, and so. 
in the empirical work, I'm really going to leverage that variation. I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so this is just a map. Um, I made it. I learned I learned GIS a couple years ago. I'm so proud of my maps. I got a couple other maps. Actually, I got a whole bunch of maps that I'm not going to show you. But if you want to see them, I've got them here. They're really, you know, it's it's really fun to make the maps. Now they do maps. What's that? They used to do it with statistics. Now they do it with math. That's right. And actually, I, I try to do it with both. Mm. OK. So um, this is just um, uh, a picture of the US metro areas. And you'll see the blue areas. Uh, the, the red dots are the major cities. And the blue areas are the metro areas. And that's where most of the people live. Some of you may ask, what's that metro area without a central city? Casper, Wyoming here. Um, so there's not an exact match. But so some states didn't, wouldn't have metro areas if they didn't have, if you, if, if you weren't a little bit lenient with the definitions. And because a number of federal programs are focused on metro areas, there's, there are political reasons to create metro areas that don't have central cities over 50,000. So Casper, Wyoming, at the 2000 census was a little bit under, but there was still a metro area drawn around it. But for the most part, every metro area has a dot. That's the big city. And then it's the county or set of counties surrounding it. Okay, So that, that's just, just a picture. OK. Sorry, yeah. Ask, um, yeah, sure. So if you're using the CMSA boundaries, yeah. you've actually got some that have multiple central cities. That's correct. That multiple yeah. Multiple my preference would be not to do that. Um, but when I talk about how I'm measuring interconnectedness of regions, which is the key independent variable in the study, um, that's not measured for separate MSAs within a CMSA. So for those dozen or so places, I need to have the whole CMSA. Um, and uh, so I, I've worried about that in terms of whether that's really biasing results towards big places or you know, if it's distorting the results. <clears throat> I can't test it directly because I don't have data to disaggregate. But I think you'll see that I'm, I'm not sure it's a, it's, a, it's a big problem. It is a, it's a consideration for sure. But I think the results are pretty robust. If I did have the sub, so CMSA is a consolidated metropolitan area. And um, so um, this uh, region, the Los Angeles area, is actually um, Los Angeles, Orange County, and Riverside. It's a big area. Um, and so, um, but that's how the, you know, it turns out people do commute from Riverside to Orange County and to LA and across the region. And so it, it makes sense that although you do have multiple central cities, that really is the labor market. That really is the region in which people's interests are sort of embedded. And so, um, you know, I'd like to have both, just the little, the individual MSAs and the CMSAs, and be able to compare the results, but I can't. Thanks for that question. Okay, any other questions on this? Okay. So the empirical strategy, again, I'm just repeating that research question. Do donors target their contributions in ways that reflect their political geography? And so the empirical strategy is to leverage cross-sectional variation in characteristics of those MSAs, um, geographic characteristics, and test whether donor behavior varies systematically with those characteristics. So let me be clear. What I'm not trying to say is, do donors in one place behave differently than donors in other places? They do. Um, some places are rich, some places are poor, some places are, um, have a lot of political activism, some don't. Some have um, highly competitive races in the elections that I'm going to be looking at, and some don't. So that's not the question that I'm asking, though. Once you control for all that stuff, do you still see an important systematic effect of the geography of the region on how people are making those donation decisions? And that's what I'm really trying to get at. Okay, So the question isn't, do people in LA behave differently than people in Casper, Wyoming? Yeah, they do. Um, so we, we wouldn't have to spend a whole hour and a half talking about that. But, but do they behave different? Do, do people in, so once you control for all those things, do people in Denver and Minneapolis, which are similar in a lot of ways but have different political geographies, do they behave differently? That's really how I want you to think about what I'm doing with the results, OK? All right, and so the hypothesis, um, the main hypothesis, is that when a region is highly interconnected, 
And I'll get to the definition of that in a moment. And I've got a couple of different ways of trying to capture that. When a region is highly interconnected, then people are going to make different kinds of campaign donations than if the region is less interconnected. So I live in a region, metropolitan Detroit, that is very not interconnected. Okay, So people live in some parts. Some people live in some parts. Other people live in other parts. They may occasionally have to go to the airport or to a Tigers game or to somewhere else around the region. But the data, all the measures of interconnectedness, which I'll show you, have to do with employment centers and, and commuting patterns and so on. Very low levels of interconnectedness. It's a highly segregated region in terms of residential segregation. And it's also a highly centralized region in terms of where people work. So basically, you've got very traditional commuting patterns by contrast, Los Angeles is the most interconnected by virtually all the measures that I've got here. You've got people live at, you know, living in Santa Monica and working in Orange County and vice versa. And you, know, and you know that because the freeways are busy in every direction always, right? There's not a commute and a reverse commute. No, everybody is moving around everywhere, OK? And so, so in a region like that, what goes on close to home and what by close to home, what I'm really going to mean operationally is in my own congressional district, um, is, is, is going to be less salient than in a place like Detroit. Because in Detroit, that's where all my interests are, close to home. I'm not moving around and commuting and doing all sorts of stuff across the region with as high a probability as somebody in Los Angeles, where you're more likely to be working in one dis congressional district and living in another and going to school in another and, and moving around in a more complicated way. And so the basic hypothesis is that when you live in a place like the Los Angeles metropolitan area, you're going to make donations that reflect that more dis diffuse set of political interests than when you live in a place like Detroit where more of your interests are going to be concentrated in a smaller number of geographic areas, a smaller number in this case of congressional districts. Okay, Does everybody understand the hypothesis? All right. So, okay. Um, all right, so, so again, the, the main independent variable I'm going to talk about now is um, characteristics of the political geography of the region. Okay, so here's the ge this is the geography part. So how are people organized around the region? And in particular, how does the interconnectedness of the region vary? So how interconnected is a given region? All right, so um, two categories of interconnectedness that I'm really looking at. Um, the, the bottom set, so you know, all these guys from, from here down, um, these are basically measures of commuting patterns, different aspects of commuting patterns. So um, some of it has to do with just, so the census asks, where do you live in the MSA and where do you work? And so there are a number excuse me, a number of responses. So first of all, about 20% of people, actually it's, it's less than that, it's interesting. So um, s something like 25% of people, but only about 12% of workers live outside of MSAs. I think, I guess a lot of people who don't work live outside of MSAs, retired people, um, unemployed people, and so on. So, so, um, so there's a small set of people who don't live in an MSA. And, and for those folks, they're, um, you know, they can report, I don't live in an MSA. For those who do live in an MSA, they can say um, either I work, I live, in an M I live in an MSA, either in the central city or outside of the central city. And then I either um, work in the central city, outside of the central city, or outside of the MSA. And so there are all these different permutations of you know, who lives where and works where. And so um, one of the set of, of measures of interconnectedness is um, how many people live in the central city and work out versus how many people live out and work in. OK, LA is a, a, of the former, right? So there, there are people working all over the place. Um, there are lots of employment centers and lots of people commuting around the region. I live, Detroit is um, the opposite. People live in the suburbs and they all move in during in, in the morning rush hour and then they all go back out in the, after, in the evening rush hour. 
So this is a much more, a much less interconnected, I'm, gonna, I'm arguing, um, a much less interconnected region. When you have people who are um, all working in the same place, you may have people you know, living in various places, but it's a, much, it's, a, it's a much more traditional pattern of commuting, as opposed to when you know you've got people living in the central city and working in lots of other places, that means you've got employment centers that, where people are working. They're not working in the central city, they're working in century city and they're working in, you know, I don't know all the all the places, Pasadena or wherever. Um, and so that's a much more interconnected uh, type of region. And then those where you've got a lot of people who live in the MSA and work outside, that's that's much less interconnected. Those folks are not connected really in an employment way to that region. They may live there, but their employment interests are somewhere else. And so um, so those are just sort of a lot of none of these is a single great measure of interconnectedness, but when you kind of put them all together, it's starting to tell something of a picture. If you've got you know, low levels of people living in the central city and working out and high levels of this, that's starting to look like a more traditional, less interconnected region, um, and so on. So, so each of these are kind of imperfect measures, but sort of together. OK. Um, we've got commuting time data. And then also, this is, I think, really interesting. So the percent of people who commute by public transit. Um, and um, this is really a public investment in interconnectedness, right? So when the public sector decides that it wants to connect people across the region and build public transit, um, that's sort of an interesting way of thinking about um, how the region is interconnected. And the more extensive the public transit system, the more investment there is in that regional interconnectedness. OK, these are, I'm, I'm getting to these secondarily these are these are my secondary measures, but I just wanted to talk about them. I really want to talk about the top measure, which is this um, dispersion of employment. And I've learned that some of you guys, I don't know if any of you in the room are involved in, in this work, but um, I know that some of you are, are working on um, these uh, measures of employment clusters and dispersion of employment. I'm very, very eager to talk to you about it, because um, you'll see this is a pretty um, basic approach, but I think it's a, a good first step. I hope you think it's a good first step, too. But um, it sort of demonstrates the direction that I want to move with that set of measures and that set of data. OK, so um, this term policy centricity is uh, maybe fami familiar to some of you, um, I would imagine. Um, and you know, it's really about how, how many disparate employment clusters there are around the region. That's really what I want to get at. So I really want to know, you know how, how likely is it that people's interests are going to lie in various places around the region? And the more employment centers you have, the more dispersed those interests are going to be. Um, so the way that I try to capture those um, is um, with a, a pretty straightforward and, and relatively simple um, hotspot analysis in ArcGIS. So what I've done is taken the zip business patterns, um, uh, total employment data by zip code. Now, zip codes are not great units of analysis because the post office draws them not exactly clear how they draw them, but um, they, they, you know, they're drawn, they're units, um, uh, they're small, relatively small, they're smaller than, you know, something big. Um, and um, so, but that's, that's the level, at which, the lowest level at which that, that, that employment data are available. Um, and so um, for each zip code, um, I've construct. I've calculated the Gettysor GI star t statistic, which basically, um, when you've got data with um, sort of ordered data um, with high and low values, it basically um, computes the average value of that unit and its neighbors, and then compares that local average to the global average. Okay, so so if I'm if I have a zip code that is high employment and it's surrounded by other high employment employment zip codes, then that local average is going to be different from the global average. Um, and so then, and if it's significantly different, so then computing a z-score for each of those values, if it's significantly different, then, um, then that zip code is coded as being part of a hotspot. 
Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a significantly high employment zip code surrounded by other high employment zip codes. And then you go to the next zip code and you compute that statistic. Now that's got a different set of neighbors, some the same but some different. And so what you get is this picture of a cluster um, by zi of zip codes that are either high or low employment. Um, and then, um, so is that, is that clear? Is that pretty clear? Okay. And so um, you can't read that, but that's the formula. Um, and so you get something that looks like this. Um, so this is obviously the Los Angeles, um, Riverside, uh, greater metropolitan area. This is the CMSA. Um, and um, so the red zip code polygons, thank you, um, are those which are part of a high employment cluster. Um, and um, you wouldn't necessarily guess this by looking at their dispersion on the map, but 49% of the zip codes are red. Um, and of course, the reason is because you have lots of small zip codes in the part in the places where people live, and you've got lots of big zip codes in the places where people don't live, and the big ones are not, and the small ones are part of employment clusters. But but half the zip codes, and you know, zip codes don't correlate perfectly with population, but they do a bit, and so um, half the zip codes are in high employment clusters. And did I put another map on here? Now, if you want to, if you want to see later, I can show you a bunch of other metro areas and sort of how that, how that works, how they look. Um, okay, so so the the key the key measure of polycentricity comes from this. It's the percent of zip codes in high employment clusters. Okay, now what I really want is the number of high employment clusters. <laughs> okay, so this kind of looks like a cluster, right? Because it's a, a, a couple of high zip codes surrounded by not. And this is kind of a separate one, and this is a separate one. And you can, you know, if you know the geography of the region, you can kind of tell where they are. Um, right now, I, d I don't have a method, um, and I'm sort of thinking about methods for then taking this input data and thinking about, okay, so now, what are they surrounded by? So I've got the high, uh, the high employment zip codes, and now the question is, you know, are those high employment zip codes surrounded by high or low? And if they're surrounded by low, then it's, it becomes a, an, a separate cluster. And if it's part of, you know, here, I guess this is sort of the bottom of Orange County. So this is, um, what's down there? San Clemente, I guess. Um, so, um, you know, the, so uh, how, do I, how do I identify this and how many of these things are there? And I'm not quite there yet. Um, so in the q and I would love to hear any ideas that you guys have. But for now, um, the, the percentage of zip codes in high employment clusters is the way I'm opera operationalizing that. And if you look at the, um, the regions, the different metropolitan areas, um, LA is different because it's so big, um, but this is a bunch of zip codes. Uh, I'm sorry, a bunch of metropolitan areas that are about a million to two million um, people, um, and um, they vary. And the the last column, I guess you can't see my headings because they're dark on dark. Uh, I can see them, but you can't see them. But um, the the middle column is the number of workers in the MSA, and then the last column is the measure that I'm talking about. The percent of zip codes that are in high employment clusters. And so places like Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, and we were talking about Detroit before, very low percentage of zip codes that are actually in high employment clusters. In other words, there are a few clusters. They're all clustered together. They're all in a couple of places. Um, and then if you look at, uh, you know, in sort of the middle range, it's interesting. You kind of think about Seattle and Minneapolis and Denver, or, you know, San Diego are kind of sort of similar in a lot of ways, size and sort of economic base and so on, but really different in the dispersion of employment centers, the proportion of zip codes that are in employment clusters. And then Atlanta um, is nearly as dispersed as Los Angeles. Los Angeles has 49% of its zip codes in high employment clusters. Um, obviously, it's a lot larger than Atlanta, but similarly dispersed, okay? Okay, so. Good, good yeah. I mean, it strikes me that it's the old uh, Midwest, Northeast, which developed early, yeah. and then the South and the Southwest, which developed late. Uh, yeah. And uh, prior, you know, 
pre and post automobile. Yeah, and we know that about those places, right? A lot of people have written about that, um, and you know, sort of the development of the western and southwest um, cities, and sort of how they're very different spatially. So that's exactly right. That's kind of where where this comes from, and this is a measure of it. But 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 what we haven't talked about is what are the implications of that? What are the consequences of that for how people interact and behave politically in those regions? So you're exactly right. I mean, that's, that's what the, the difference in that, you know, sort of the, the macro differences um, are picking up. But, you know, even within that, so if you, if you look at, you know, Denver and, and uh, San Diego, or a better comparison is Seattle and San Diego. You know, Seattle has 20% and San Diego's got, you know, 34%. That's a big, that's a big difference. So even within in, you know the old and new you still have pr quite a lot of variation and I'm going to try to leverage that but you're exactly right that's kind of where this that's the backstory that's where a lot of this comes from yeah it also corresponds to the urban sprawl index yeah I don't know how you looked at it because you know, Atlanta is probably one of the right. highest sprawl city yeah. Phoenix Miami all of these um, so exactly. there is that kind of but that is actually what I'm trying to capture. Consistent you're, you're with PR, right. yeah. 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 Here, that's well, exactly right. Yeah. 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 So actually, uh, um, your point um, sort of implies a, a slightly different approach to studying this is rather than looking at employment dispersion, um, you know, I could also look at residential dispersion and um, you know because this is kind of getting one half of that equation right this is you know people live in a region and then how dispersed is their employment and then but you could also say people work in a region how dispersed is their um, residency so you know and and certainly there are measures of residential dispersion that I could incorporate into this as well and, and, and there's a lot of people who, are, who kind of wonder often uh, whether there are some partisan implications from mm -hmm. the sprawling areas about Republican uh, yeah. and so non-sprawling ones not. Let's, I have, a, I have a, a marker in the implications slide to talk about that. If we don't get back to it, would you bring that up again when we talk about that? Because I, I really, that's a really key piece of this that I want to make sure that we have time to talk about, um, which is, you know, I'm not talking about partisanship at least for the body of the talk, but I think we can't not talk about partisanship. So we'll, I'll get back to that uh, towards the end. Yeah. Is there any correlation between the um, the policy intensity measure and the fragmentation of local government? And the fragmentation of local government. Um, Probably. Well, okay. So I, um, I I haven't tested that directly. I know that. Um, Pennsylvania is one of the most fragmented states. Um, Michigan is moderately so. Um, I don't know about. Yeah, no, I assume it's actually it's consolidated the city county, so it's not yeah, it's, it's not fragmented at all. So yeah. I'm not so sure that you would have. Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, so again, it's a very good question. I you know so. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, Georgia, Georgia has more counties than cities. Yeah, so, so there are lots of levels of government here, right? Um, and so, you know, so a lot of the fragmentation in a place like Pennsylvania is with special districts um, and some local governments. Which might be um, relevant to what you're looking at. Because if you've got lots of little governments, but there's a big consolidated <coughs> school district, then that's yeah. going to drive yeah. yeah. about yeah. candidates. Let me, let me get into the, in, the empirical results, and then let's come back to that, because I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where that fits, but I think it's a missing piece here. So I, I like your suggestion. So let me come back to that. Oops, I'm not going to put my stuff on here, because there's a big sign that says, don't put your water on there. <laughs> I did not. Just so you see, I did not violate the norm. OK. All right, so, so I'm glad you're interested in the how I'm trying to characterize MSAs. And I, you know, let's, get, let's um, continue to think about that. For a moment, let's switch to the other side of the equation, to the dependent variable, to the behavior that I'm trying to capture and understand uh, as a 
consequence of some of these um, characteristics, these political geography characteristics of the regions. Okay, so um, I'm a data geek. I love data. This is big data. It's really fun. Um, it's the, um, the FEC, the Federal Election Commission um, Campaign Finance Reports. Um, and uh, it's, um, as I suggested earlier, looking at um, the donations by individual donors, so not by political parties, not by PACs, not by corporations, not by other candidates, but regular individual donors to individual candidates. So not to PACs or to um, other organizations, but to candidates directly. So this is, again, a donor writes a check to a candidate's committee. Okay, so there are lots of other things going on in the campaign finance world and in the database. Believe me, it's really big and messy and it's this great big access database. But I'm just looking at that one subset of contribution behavior because that's really, you know, again, as I suggested at the very beginning, I'm interested in understanding how um, campaign, to, uh, how the geography of a region kind of filters through people's political interests and into their donation decisions. And so this is the most direct measure of that, okay? It's you know where somebody lives and you know from where they're making the donation and you know where their district is and you're looking at to whom are they donating, okay? So that's, that's the logic of using the individual uh, campaign contributions. I'm looking at U.S. House candidates. Um, I've got lots of, well, there's plenty of data on Senate candidates and all sorts of other um, candidates, but really um, House candidates are more wedded to a local geography, right? So they represent a, a geographic district. Those di districts often don't correspond to metro areas, in fact, Deliberately, they slice up metropolitan areas depending on, you know, sort of who the candidate is and where their various constituencies are and are they in the majority party in the, of the legislature that's drawing the districts and so on. So, so we know that there's a spatial mismatch between congressional districts and metropolitan areas and that's really cool. I'm going to try to leverage that here. So U.S. House candidates is, the, is sort of the, the level at which that spatial mismatch may be most interesting. Looking at 2007-08, um, two years ago when I started this project, that was the most recent election data. Um, 0910 is now available and it's on my computer, but I haven't looked at it yet, um, but I will. And um, uh, the tricky part with these data is that although donors are required to report their addresses, the FEC does not link the donor addresses to the rest of the donor file. Um, it's in a PDF file, conveniently. <laughs> So you can't actually see, you can't merge those files and know where each donor lives. The um, Center for Responsive Politics did that for 2007-8, and they've also done it for 9-10. So, um, so I'm using their version of that cleaned up FEC data. So I've got an address for every donor, and so it's trivi trivial to geocode uh, <coughs> using street map. Um, all of the donor addresses. And so for each donor, I've now got a point on a map. Um, and then when you overlay the boundary files, I can then also, for each donor, determine in which MSA, or not MSA, they're in, um, and their congressional district. And then I also know the recipient. So I also know the candidate that received that donation, what's their congressional district? Is it the same or different from the donors? And then also which MSA or MSAs does that district lion. Some districts um, hit two MSAs um, and some are or don't. So it's a little bit of a, a complicated coding scheme, but um, it's not too bad. So basically for every donation, I know whether it was made to a candidate that's in the same, it, that's in district. So I'm a donor giving a donation to a, a candidate for Congress in my own district where I live. Um, whether it's in region, out of district, so um, it's within my MSA but in a different district, or if it's out of region, out of district, which is obviously out of my region and out of my district, okay? 
This is the this is the kind of be, this is the form of behavior that I'm most interested in. Okay, not surprisingly, right? So we're talking about how interconnected is a region, how are people's interests distributed around the region, and what I want to know is in places where they're distributed around the region, do you have people doing more of this? Okay, so making donations to candidates who are in a different district than themselves, but also but still within their metro area. Um, in a in a way that is consistent with um, donating to other candidates around the region who may represent that donor's interests. Does that make sense? Okay. So, what proportion of donations do you all think are what I'm calling IROD in region out of district? You mean U.S. wide? Yep. In the 2007-08 congressional election. So, okay, so ju let's just think about this for a second. There are 435 congressional districts. Most MSAs have about seven, uh, uh, well, the average is about, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. Um, uh, the average is about six um, congressional districts per, parts of six congressional districts per MSA, although that average is really skewed by a couple of large. So most have two, three, four, five congressional districts that are partially covered by a given MSA. So if people, so that's about, um, what, 1%? So if people were sort of randomly distributing their donations to all congressional districts, you'd have about you know, one, two percent uh, going to districts within their region. So you think it's more than one or two percent? Of course it is, I wouldn't be talking about it. <laughs> so how much more, 10 percent? 50 percent? Top line, 29 percent of donations and 31 percent of dollars are going to Candidates within a donor's MSA, but in a different district. Okay, so um, so the the largest proportion are going to in district. So uh, John Dingle is my member of Congress, and even though John Dingle does not need my money, I'm still making donations to John Dingle. Um, um, 32, 30, uh, almost 33 percent are going across the country, outside of my region, outside of my district. You know, I'm making donations to Nancy Pelosi. Um, and so that would be the second. But the approximately 30% that are going to congressional districts within my region, outside of my own district. OK? So, so that's, the, that's the, so now the question is, does that vary systematically with the region? In more interconnected regions, do you have more of that kind of behavior? And in less interconnected regions, do you have less of it? Yeah. Can you tell from this data set whether the candidates are incumbents or challengers? I have control for that, yeah. Not, this combines everything, but in the regressions that I'm going to run in a second, I do, yeah. Um, and um, you so. You imagine that, for instance, the out of region, out of district, you get more donations to somebody like Nancy Pelosi, somebody who's an incumbent and yeah. a particular role. Like Indeed, yeah, reason. exactly. Um, so I'll show you. I'll show you those results um, in a second. Um, something else I wanted to say there too. I have another piece of this study is looking at the effect of redistricting. So um, when you change the district boundaries, if you're in a more interconnected region, does it matter less? Um, because people are used to making donations to candidates around the region. And um, that, so, so that's tricky though, because um, you can't just say, you know, after a redistricting, a, a, the num a district number might change. I was in district, 11 and now I'm in 13, but I still have the same incumbent. So that's really not a change, but um, it also might be that I was in District 11 before and I'm still in District 11, but now I do have a different incumbent. So it's, it's very, it's complicated, it's fun. It's a complicated data problem, but, but that, you know, so all of those questions relate to that. Um, but I, I will show you that I, I do control for that, yeah. Um, so help me think through why using something very simple like the number of congressional districts within a metro area would not be a measure of potential interconnectedness, right? So, I mean, there's a certain accounting relationship that if you have only a single 
congressional district, then you can't have any high rods. So, okay, so actually, thank you, thank you for that. The last point that you just made, which is the regressions that I'm going to run are only on districts that have two or more congressional, uh, I'm sorry, um, people who live in MSAs that have two or more congressional districts. So you're right. Um, I do control for the number of districts and also the number of zip codes because I've, one of my big, uh, you know, my major independent variables is based on the number of zip codes. Um, and that's, a, that's an attempt to get at sort of just geographic size of the region because they vary hugely. Um, but I, I think there's still something, di it's not just size, you know, it really is how do people move around the region and, and hence how are their interests distributed around the region. That's really what I'm trying to get at. And so you're right, there is an accounting point, and I do control for that um, in the regressions that I'm going to show in a second. Um, so I think if I didn't, it would be really problematic. You know, you wouldn't be able to tell, is it just that it's big or is, you know, and there are a lot of choices, or is it really about the, the systematic uh, differences in interconnectedness? Did you have a hand up? Just stretch. Okay. Um, all right. Here's the empirical model. Again, the unit of analysis is a donation by an individual donor to an individual candidate. Um, and then I'm also going to aggregate those in a couple different ways. Um, the, um, the dependent variable, I run three very sim similar but slightly different models. One is just what's the probability that a given donation is IROD versus not. I'll also, I've also run it um, just comparing IROD donations to OROD, the out of district, out of region, the far away ones, and then also just comparing in district, to, I, I'm sorry, IROD to in district, my own district. Um, those results are remarkably similar, so it really does look like IROD is a distinctive form of behavior. Um, the other thing you can do with this FEC data is um, every individual donor has a 12-digit identifying ad identification number um, and for people in the same family the first 11 numbers are the same and then the last digit is different so now I don't exactly know how the FEC knows if two people are in the same family um, I think it's surname and address um, but there are lots of them. So there are a lot of combined, you know, there are a lot of people, different donors that have the first 11 digits and the last one. I'm probably, so using that information, I'm probably under capturing the number of family donations. Um, but for any given donor, they're given a unique identifier. And so I can also look at the percent of an individual donor's donations, which are IROD. So a lot of people make multiple donations over the course of, the campaign, sometimes to the same candidate, sometimes to different candidates, sometimes to different races, sometimes to different parties. Um, and so I can, you know, I can either treat every donation as independent or I can look, I can aggregate over an individual donor's whole set of donations during this election or over his or her whole family's set of donations. And, you know, I don't know how your families work. Mine are not coordinated. Um, my donations are not coordinated, but I know many people's are. So to the extent that some families Families coordinate their donations. I'm going to try to pick some of that up too. Okay. Um, as I said, the measures of interconnectedness, the, um, the 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 different measures that we're talking about, is are the main independent variables, and then the controls are MSA level, congressional district level, and donor level um, characteristics. And I'll show you exactly what those are in a second. Um, and then um, clustering by MSA. Um, I. I'm not sure if I need to do this, but if there is something strange about lo the Los Angeles metropolitan area that makes people behave differently that I can't observe through my controls, then at least I'm, um, I'm stacking the decks against myself. Um, I'm making it harder. I'm sort of um, shrinking the standard errors by doing this. And so I'm making it a little bit harder to say, yeah, there's something systematic going on. It might just be that LA is strange. Uh, no offense, and um, and 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 that's what that clustering takes care of. Um, okay, so here here are a number of regression results, and I need to make a note to myself to change the header because you can't read my headings. Let me just tell you what they are. Each column is the result of a separate 
regression. The first is a logit on that binary dependent variable, the probability of making an IROD donation. And then the others are the um, percent of an individual's donations, the percent of the individual's dollars donated, the percent of a family's donations, and the percent of a family dollars. So they're basically all the same regression with a slightly different dependent variable. And then these are the key independent variables. Um, the various measures of interconnectedness and polycentricity, which I talked about in a previous slide, and the sign, positive or negative, is the hypothesized sign for each of those factors. So to the extent that greater interconnectedness is positively correlated or positively related to IROD donations, that's how this particular variable is coded and would show up uh, under that hypothesis. And then the when I actually run the regressions, every one of them also includes a measure of the density of the region, median household income, the number of congressional districts, the number of zip codes, um, the total contributions uh, made in that MSA, the percent of open seats MSA-wide, whether the donor's seat was an open seat, Actually, I guess I don't have incumbency here. Well, I guess I do, because it, it's whether it's an open seat or not. Um, whether the, the, um, don the recipient and the donor's um, incumbent are of the same party, which would affect the probability that the donor is going to donate to an in-district donation. The number of contributions by fam families within the MSA and the dollar amount con contributed um, by families in the MSA. So that's just controls. That's trying to get at all the other stuff that might affect the probability of making an IROD donation. And then what we're left with here is the marginal effect of each of the interconnectedness measures on the probability or the proportion of IROD donations. Is that clear how these regressions are set up? OK. Does it capture at all? Um, I mean, part of the question about Nancy Pelosi is it's not just incumbency, it's power. Yeah, it's how long an incumbency, because you know, presumably if you're there for a longer time, yeah. you yeah. gain yeah. more power yeah. over different communities. Yeah. Um, I started down that road at one point, and it became a morass because I really thought, okay, so now, now we're looking at a donor in an agricultural region, and so really what I want to know is, are they making a donation to the chair of the ag committee? And then it, it became, it started to feel very ad hoc, and I just didn't know. So, so you, ad hoc. <laughs> well said, thank you. Yes, clever. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, so no, um, this doesn't capture that, um, and um, you know, it's a, a suggestion about whether it needs to. And, I, and I'm not exactly sure. I mean, maybe we can, you know, pick that back up again in the Q and A. But it, it doesn't at this point. So you could just do donor fixed effects. You have enough data here. There are multiple contributions to candidates. You could just wipe out any issues of that with donor fixed effects. So there are a lot of donors that only make one donation. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, you mean candidate, candidate fixed effects? Fixed yeah, fixed yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I could do that. Um, it's really, you know, for those of you who run regressions, it's really fun to have, um, you know, about 400,000 observations because you can do all sorts of stuff. The pro here's the problem, though. Okay, this is this is an interesting challenge. We know very little about the individual donors. Okay, so if I was interested, if I was using survey data and I wanted to put together a model of, um, you know, what are the factors that determine an individual donor's donation decisions, I put in all sorts of stuff like that individual's partisanship and their ideology and their fa past voting behavior and their occupation and their maybe their gender and race and all sorts of stuff. We don't know that about these donors. We know where they live. Um, we know for a subset of them, if they choose to report it, what their occupation is, but it's not required. Um, and we know their name, and we know their family, and we know where they live. And that's really all we know about them. We know things about their congressional district, and we know things about their MSA, but we don't know a lot about the individual donors. So, I mean, But you're right, I could do a, I could do a recipient fix, fixed effect. I mean, another way to think of what you're doing really don't have an individual level analysis, you have an MSA level analysis. When you, essentially, you could analyze these data more conservatively by looking at the fraction of donations that are IROD 
and by MSA. And so your true sample size is more like, I don't know how many MSAs there are. That's, well, like well, that's why I clustered by MSA. Yeah, it's, but people always say that there's some interesting literature on this and how you do it. And the clustering is right, but uh, under certain assumptions. But a much more conservative way and more compelling way, I think, mm -hmm. is to just do it at the MSA level. And if you find effects there, yeah. it's, it's quite compelling. So I have done some of this at the MSA level, and I don't have that here. And to be honest, I can't. <laughs> have any of you lost a little bit of your short-term memory? <laughs> I don't remember what the results say. But, um, but, but that's a good suggestion. Um, and um, yeah, that, that is a good suggestion. Yeah, Jen. Sorry for coming in late. I don't, know. I don't really know what these variables are. Um, but can you tell us something about the big difference in the magnitude of the coefficients between column one of numbers? Why, and yes, I can. <laughs> All right. So, so these are the the change in the predicted. So this is from the first logit regression. So, um, there, you know, the the dependent variable is for an individual donation. What's the probability that it's IROD? Um, and then these are the predicted probabilities that derive from that uh, logistic regression. Um, and so this is moving each of the independent variables from its minimum to its maximum value. What's the change in the probability? Okay. So this gives you a sense of how and holding everything else at their mean. Um, and so this gives you a sense of, OK, if you increase from the minimum to the maximum the, the percent of zip codes in high employment clusters, if you go from the least polycentric to the most, um, it's not huge, actually. You increase it by 15 percentage points. Um, some of them are really big. So um, you know, the, the, um, the proportion of people that commute sort of a moderate uh, distance, which is hypothesized to be positively related to IROD, so that's basically people who are driving from Santa Monica to Los Angeles or, or however that might be. Some days I know it's not 30 to 60 minutes, but I think most people would report that that's the length of their commute. Um, so that's big. That's, you know, um, a 61 percentage point increase uh, by going from the very lowest level, which is only 0.06, to the very highest, which is uh, 0.38. So this gives you a sense of the relative magnitudes. And so, and again, th these are all of these are included in the regression. And I've also done, you know, I, I there's a, some collinearity between the various measures, um, not too much, um, and that's deliberate. I'm trying to get at different aspects of the interconnectedness of the region. I haven't, you know, I, I haven't gone carefully one by one and looked at them separately, but I don't think I want to do that. I think the whole point is that um, they're all picking up various pieces of the extent of interconnectedness of the region, and so I think I want them all there together. So this is a little bit misleading because it kind of gives you a sense that each of them is operating separately, but I think they're really all kind of operating together. But it does give you a, a bit of a, a sense of the relative magnitudes, yeah. You know, I just, going from the min to the max really says sometimes you're going from Casper City to LA. It might be better if you did one standard deviation yeah. change or inner core tolerance. Totally agree, yeah. But the other thing is these are very non-standard things to, uh, try and interpret. It'd be nice if you just compared it with median household income. So what is a change in something we kind of understand yeah. affects yep. voting patterns, race, or whatever. Well, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the most, I never worked with these measures before. I imagine most of you haven't. Some of you may have, actually. Um, but uh, that's, a, that's a nice um, presentational uh, suggestion. I think that totally makes sense. But, yeah. Um, is the average commute the average commute time? Yeah. Why is that loading in negatively when the percentage with moderate commute is loading in positively? It seems like you're getting opposite results there, or am I missing something? Well, they're both, you know, they're both there. So it's, you know, controlling for average commute, what's the percent? So they're, you know, they're both marginal effects in a multivariate regression. No, I get that, but I'm just, so, I, I would think that if your argument is about polycentricity and people having interest in multiple places, 
and you expect a longer commute to increase your chances of this I rod, why are you getting I expect it to, I expect it to be nonlinear. So when it's really long, then you're commuting outside of your region. So if you're commuting 90 minutes, most metro areas are not 90 minutes big. And so that suggests that you know you're living in Chicago and working in Milwaukee. But then shouldn't you enter average commute in a quadratic form or a log form? I have. Yeah, I've, I've just tried to simplify this. Um, and um, maybe it didn't work. Maybe it's uh, more confusing than simplifying. But um, yes. Um, uh, I can and should and have and maybe will uh, on your suggestion and um, um, when I when I put them in separate when I don't have the commute 30 to 60 um, average commute is insignificant which does suggest a, I think a nonlinear effect there and w but when I have them in combination then I think it's just picking up the the long tail on average commute so maybe what I don't this that to me so you know, as I, I started with the commuting measures and then have moved more to the employment cluster measures. And I'm convinced that the employment clusters is really the better measure. So, um, you know, now I'm at the point in the paper where I'm trying to figure out, okay, how much of this is sort of extraneous and how much is really, you know, sort of expanding on the core story about, uh, polycentricity and employment clusters. So um, I'd love, you know, thank you for the suggestion. I'm, you know, sort of needing to, to work a bit more on that. Yeah, Jen. Um, not, to, not to overwork this, <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> these just, they strike me as not really making a lot of sense. Um, the average commute <clears throat> is about 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the median commute is about 20. Nationally? Nationally. Uh, and the average commute increases with the size of the MSA. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not at all clear what exactly you're picking up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would say that, you know, it may be that insignificance is closer to what may be going on. Uh, <clears throat> never mind all that. <coughs> Sorry. Only 20% of all trips are work trips anyway. Yes. And so if we're actually looking at connectivity or connections, what you'd really like to know is where all the people, all the places that people go yeah. and how connected are they. Okay. So, so um, I would, I would vote be? for, a, you know, your top measure there, whatever it might be, might be a better idea. Although, just as a corrected a, a counter argument to Jen's point, the, the democratic theorists would argue that the places where you actually develop political views are most likely in your home neighborhood community and at work, which would suggest to me that your work commute is yeah. actually quite relevant, much more so than going to the grocery store, because it's not clear that in going to the grocery store you're actually interacting with anyone in yeah, a way with social workers. <laughs> well, yeah, in LA, but maybe. So, so yes. Going to the bowling alley to bowl. So, but from my perspective, that's a testable question that I, I don't know um, how significant those non-work trips are and you're right that in this analysis those are the data that I'm employing and so embedded in that is sort of an assumption is a privileging of those trips um, and I don't I don't know you know I I, um, I don't know what we would find empirically about non-work trips and you know stay tuned maybe it'll end up in the final version of, of the paper there, it seems like so I should say the 30 to 60 um, was, I won't call it, I, I certainly won't call it data mining, because um, that would be bad. But, um, but, but, there, but I have um, it, um, experimented um, with alternative measures of sort of a moderate commute. And you're also picking up an income effect. Yeah, but I'm also controlling for income. But you're only calling for median household income, Correct. right? Which is yep. a... Uh, census tract level? No, MSA level. MSA level, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the commute is variable across yep. the MSA and it's Indeed. correlated with household income, the persons. So since, you you know, so I think you may be picking up some of the income effect that you're not capturing elsewhere. So how would you deal with that? I'm done. I'm done, by the way. So <laughs> now I get to ask some questions. <laughs> you're controlling for income. I'm, I'm, but, but I think Jen's point is that I'm controlling for median, median income. Yeah, that's why I was just, yeah. I think that earlier suggestion was a very good one. Um. 
doesn't it doesn't it hurt really deep down inside to start with 500,000 observations and reduce it to 278. I mean, I hear you, but man, it's, you know, that, that seems like a lot questions of- questions for which you need the- I think you're right. That's, a, that's a better way to say it, yeah. Yeah, but the nice thing is, by the way, you don't need standard errors because you have a census of all contributions. So I do, As I far as I'm concerned, there's no point in looking at standard errors. You know the exact relationship. Fair enough. Oh boy. Okay. So all, all, all sorts of questions. Let me just um, oh, give me one second. I know I said I'm done, but let me just let me just put the slide up that says what I think the conclusions and implications are, and then I really will be done, and then we'll totally open it up. Okay. So summary of results. I think you know. So um, based on these results, I am. Um, uh, you know, I, I believe the results are suggestive of this effect, that really the political geography of the region, the interconnectedness of the region, really does systematically shape how people um, participate, engage in the political process, and in particular, where they send their donations. Um, and um, again, you know, obviously there are lots of um, uh, additional considerations about how to measure interconnectedness, how to measure that behavior, but certainly, you know, these results I think are strongly consistent with that hypothesis. And um, so, so as a sort of first cut at the question, um, I feel comfortable saying that for today, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. Um, uh, so, so let me just put, you know, sort of think about from my political science perspective what, what I think this means. So, you know, we, we in, in political theory uh, and thinking about representation, we really think about a di either, either a very dyadic view of representation where I as a citizen am represented by my member of Congress or my, my representative in whichever body it is that I'm thinking about. Um, and a lot of research seeks to compare what I do with what that representative does and call that representation, make a judgment about, am I being well represented? Well, if John Dingell, who's my representative, votes in my interest, then ta-da, hooray, I'm well represented. This, I think, suggests that well, duh, it's obviously much more complicated than that, um, but in a, in a specific way, that there are places where people really understand their interests to not be highly localized in that way, that it really is a more regionalized understanding of representation, that, yeah, I might live in John Diggle's district, but my interests lie outside of it across my region, and I'm going to behave in a way that advances those interests that are not highly localized. But not everybody is going to have that because they live in different places. And so this notion of a regionalized view of representation where the political geography of the region really affect the extent to which that relationship, that set of regional relationships are really key to assessing how well represented people are, I think is a very different way of thinking about representation. Um, so putting my political science hat on pretty firmly, I think um, you know, we need to think a little bit about what the implications are of this result for how we understand and evaluate representation in political outcomes. And then of course, um, you know, we're all policy folks, so you know we get, we need to think about regions in policy, um, and let me say it a little bit less sarcastically. So you know people live in regions, people understand regions to be politically important, and so to the extent that policies can be designed to address regional interests as opposed to highly localized interests, there may be some real representational value to that. Okay, now I'm really done. So questions. Um, first, I really think this is really interesting uh, work, and I was wondering whether or not you see the kind of redistricting that's happening right now might provide you with an opportunity to really even strengthen this um, test of theory in that you're going to be able to find folks that still donate to a candidate in their region, but that is now out of district. Yes. So you could look at seeing if repeat donation, you know, the, the repeat donations systematically differ. Um, for people that have lost their congressperson based on the level of regional perspective that their MSA has. So this is a picture, oh, you can't see the red and blue very well. 
So I've started to do a little bit of that. Um, and to, so this is Georgia, um, had a mid-cycle redistricting, court-ordered mid-cycle redistricting um, before the 2005-06 election. And so um, the top are the 109th uh, districts and the bottom on the left are the 110th. And then the picture shows, although you can't see it, um, in red, the people who are now in districts with a, a different incumbent than in the previous election and the blue are not. And so you can tell probably where most of those are going to be because it's close to the boundaries. Um, and, um, and then, so I think what you're suggesting is then, you know, is the probability of, you know, you, you, you certainly can look at that, which I think gives you some real leverage on what's the, what's the nature of the relationship that citizens develop with their, um, their members of Congress? And, um, you know, to what extent are the political boundaries consequential there? And to what extent is sort of past behavior, experience, knowledge, information, and that sort of thing uh, consequential? So, um, yes, absolutely. Now, this is just, you know, there, there have only been a small number of mid-cycle redistricts, re redistrictings in the, in the recent past. But you're right. Now, every state is going to, um, virtually every state will have boundary changes. Um, to the next election. So absolutely, if you want to you know, talk more about the data and how to do that, I'd be happy to. But I think you're right. It's a really nice opportunity to be able to think about that. And then how does interconnectedness affect that? So if you're in a region that's highly interconnected, you wouldn't expect those boundary changes to matter quite as much, right? If and so I think that that provides a, an additional sort of supplemental test of the same hypothesis. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. We're on the totally same way, wavelength on that one. Let, let me get some folks that haven't. Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. It's very interesting. Um, I have a question of going back to the debate, and I'm going to actually take Jen's side of the debate just for a second. <laughs> yeah, but I think in a different Yay. way. Um, <laughs> And make a case for you started off the talk with saying you know you're focused on the employment side um, and you think that the other half would be kind of looking at this from the housing side. Um, so buying your argument, so kind of saying that you know it matters, but maybe only 50 percent, right, in terms of how political geography matters. Um, I wonder if you have any suspicions, right? Because housing, those other 80 percent of trips that you're taking to the grocery store, to other places, to schools, and every place else. That's where precincts get walked, right? That's where you cast your votes for the most part. That's where you um, also would sign any petitions for candidates to actually stand for election, yeah. right? In those local yeah. contexts. That's yeah. not happening at employment yeah. places. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you have any suspicions. A, what do you think you would find on the flip side? Yeah. And then the second question I have, which again goes back to mobilization and goes back to the politics, is really whether or not you think this area, and I work in a center that says place matters, so I'm not kind of coming at this from a hostile way, but how long do we think these kinds of place-based effects might work given the rise in online fundraising mm -hmm. and yeah. the ways in which it's easy for me to point and click and yeah. send money to Elizabeth Warren and know yeah. what's going on, this is the mobilization yeah. part, know what's going on in Elizabeth Warren's campaign through multiple emails once I make the first donation that might encourage me to give more even though I live 3,000 miles yeah. away. Yeah. Right. And so I I'm just wondering yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, how you see that fitting in with this other research in political science that's really focused on yeah. online fundraising. So I'll, I'll answer your second question first. Um, you know, it's an empirical question, sure. but but um, you know the anecdotal evidence thus far is absolutely that um, you have higher and higher numbers and proportions of individual donations. Um, which are made online going to um, a relatively small number of high profile candidates. So, um, and, and, and in a, in sometimes in a coordinated way and in sometimes in a less coordinated way. So um, how interesting over time to just kind of watch that and you can do that with this, at least the geocoding met methodology, right? You still know where the donors are and you know to where they're giving. And so, you know, I, do, I haven't seen any systematic analysis of that, but I would absolutely expect that as, um, as information about candidates across the country becomes more accessible to regular donors through the internet and through social media, that um, the ORAD donations are going to be more likely 
and I haven't tested it, but I would be really surprised if it wasn't true. Um, the other piece though, so two pieces of your, the first question that you asked I think are really, really important. One is we're not looking at solicitation. Um, I don't have data right now on um, who asked people to give, and, uh, but we know that's important, right? So in survey data, which asks people, why did you make, you know, did you make a donation to a candidate in the last election? And then why, you know, why did you make that donation? Um, you know, most people say, because I was asked. <laughs> Um, either by the candidate or by a neighbor or by a friend or by you know a coworker or somebody else. There's a really good study by a woman named Betsy Sinclair at um, Chicago that's looking at that and sort of a more sort of a social network way. Um, so these data are not linked to solicitation, mobilization, and so on. So um, that that's sort of a black box here. You know, we don't know why people or sort of how people figure out within an interconnected region that I work here, the candidate in the in the district that my business is in is X candidate. Um, there are a whole bunch of possible reasons. They have information. They have maybe personal contact at work. They have a whole bunch of other mechanisms, but we don't know exactly what those are. But one of the things that I really like about the suggestion of looking at residential um, geography or the political geography of people's residences as opposed to simply the sort of economic political economic geography of a region is you can actually you know look at various measures of how inner interconnected a neighborhood is for example and move to a diff now we start talking about all right let's start to think about the very local area in which a person lives as a network within which they're embedded um, and then how does that affect the kind of information that they get about candidates and about other politics and how does that relate to other forms of political behavior and so on. So I kind of like the flipping the question because now you can start to think about, I think I'm still interested in the um, interconnectedness of the region and taking that level of geography, but of course within that are other potentially relevant geography. So you can imagine sort of a layering of that and really thinking about, okay, now what's more important? Is it the broader economic inter, inter, inter connectedness of the region, or is it the more local sort of residential area and how interconnected that is and which of those matter more for understanding political behavior? I'm not sure I would use campaign donations as the dependent variable in that study, um, but I think you know there are lots of ways to then think about, well, what other forms of, of political behavior might you want to look at and think about you know sort of the interconnectedness of the region and the integratedness of a neighborhood and how those things interact. So you know it's a great question. I, I you know, there's a lot to it that contributes to what I'm doing here. I don't know if I answered the question, but you just got me thinking about a lot of stuff. So. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, Jeff. Um, I want to come back to this difference between Detroit and Los Angeles um, as the, in the commute pattern into the center versus commuting across. And, um, and the reason I'm interested in that is because I'm trying to understand what this what is what is causing people mm -hmm. to give to candidates in other mm -hmm. areas. Uh, because in, in some sense, if you get people from north of Detroit and Ann Arbor and so on commuting into the, they're connecting with people from across the a big region, mm -hmm. right? They're just connecting in the workplace. And if workplace is so important, why would that? have been, been identifying with their workers, their co-colleagues yeah. who come from other places. Yeah. Uh, just as it was if, you know, you went to some place not in the central city. So there's something about going into the central city versus going, you know, say you live in Santa Monica and you go work in, um, uh, I don't know, Manhattan, Manhattan Beach. Beach right? <laughs> and and a, a hypothesis around that is that when you get these more dispersed patterns, you're getting people from upper middle class in, in neighborhoods working in other upper middle class neighborhoods mm -hmm. that may be similar to their own or, you know, you know. And so there's more of an identity uh, across these work and living conditions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, such that they can 
then they, they may actually, when they're in Manhattan Beach working, they may actually even go out to dinner there, or they may, you know, uh, whereas I don't, that's maybe less likely. No one goes out to do dinner in Detroit, right? right. right. So, You're the restaurants So if it's, <laughs> if it's purely a, you know, if it's purely a bedroom community commuting into a central city yes. that's kind of empty. Yes. Uh, that's a different social experience than if you're going from Santa Monica to Manhattan Beach yes. and working and yes. living in those two places. You may actually get to know Manhattan Beach in a way and identify with it. So uh, what I'm trying to understand is the, the social personal dynamics of why yeah. you find this effect. And, and it, it, I don't know if it's purely what you're terming interconnectedness. Because I think of going into the central city as a form of interconnectedness. Yes. Uh, at least if you're looking at the worst workplace, or if it's this form of social interaction that's uh, in the workplace and it's surrounding the workplace that is maybe different. So I have been struggling with that very question. And um, I think you have raised an, a really um, powerful explanation for how those, why those two different patterns are different. Clearly they are different in the data. So you, you see very different contribution patterns when you have these different kinds of communities. So, um, but you know, sort of taking a step back and thinking about you know, how, you know, what is different about uh, working in a central city versus working somewhere else. And I've, I've really struggled with that. Um, the, the way I had been thinking about it is similar, but without the social identity piece, which is um, you know, just looking at a place like Detroit or looking at a place like St. Louis, um, you know, there's not a connection to the downtown in the same way. You know, if you ask people, where are you from, um, who live by me, they don't say Detroit. They say Metro Detroit or the Detroit suburbs or Ann Arbor. Um, but, you know, if you ask people um, in San Diego, where are you from, they'll, they'll often say San Diego, I think. And, and they may not even be from San Diego. They may be from Del Mar or somewhere else. But, um, so, so there's this question of regional identity, um, and um, but but I but the way that you've talked about it in sort of social class terms is really cool. I hadn't thought of it in that sense. Um, so I don't I can't say for sure whether that's happen, whether that's the explanation. It's very consistent with the patterns, and if you look at the places where you have um, you know a lot of of the more interconnectedness, you do have um, you know sort of um, it, you don't think of it as bedroom communities, and so you know in. In fact, one of the things that Detroit has really struggled with is to try to make it less of a bedroom community region so that people would be more invested in the downtown and they would choose to live downtown and they would support retail and all different kinds of development downtown, which just doesn't exist there right now. So, I, so clearly there's something about that pattern of commuting that changes people's relationships to the central city. But the way you're talking about it in social class terms, I really, I think is really interesting. So, um, you know, I hope, I, I think I, you know, I need to think a little bit more about how to, how to test that explicitly, but. You know, this demonstrates that geography matters. And the next question is uh, why? Yeah, what are the, right, what, what right, right. The yeah, that? absolutely, right. Absolutely. That's my, and that's my longer term research oh, agenda. Okay. We're out of time, but. Okay. Yeah, actually, yeah, uh, we're out of time. But okay. if you wanna, if you wanna do that, I know the the videos are on it. People said, thank okay. you very much. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your comments.